Well, good morning. You okay? <laughs> we are just thinking. Uh, don't let me your Bible to uh, John chapter 6. We're going to get back into the series today. And, uh, while you're turning to John chapter 6, just let's try to bring you back to square. We're going to wait for five weeks. Um, this is the chapter where Jesus fed the 5,000. And of course, that was a, a miracle. I, mean, I call that a super miracle uh, to be able to feed that many people. And uh, it was just a beautiful sight. After that, uh, kind of split from the disciples, took them away across the Sea Galilee, he went up on the Mount to pray. Later, he went to them, walking on the water, another super miracle. And, um, and so, eventually, after all that had happened that night, Peter walking on the water, of course, he got into the boat, and the boat was immediately on the other side of the shore. That kind of brings us back to where we are now. Now, you know all those things, but everybody else and the crowds and the people and all, they didn't know all those things. And uh, so, this is kind of where we're going to start today. We're looking at John uh, chapter 6, verse 22, and, and following a few verses here with me. It says, the next day, the crowd that stood on the other side of the sea saw that there was no other small boat there except one, and that Jesus had not entered with his disciples into the boat, but that his disciples had gone away alone. There came other small boats from Tiberias near the place where they had ate the bread after the Lord had given thanks. So when the crowd saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they themselves got in the small boat, and they came to find him seeking Jesus. And when they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, where did you get here? And so what we've got here is, is really a few verses. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, because but it's just not going to take time to do that today. But basically, what, what he's telling us is that they, they were in total confusion. Uh, they were like a bunch of turbines in the go go. They just didn't know which way to go, up and down, and all around. They were, they were literally going back and forth, uh, sending boats across the sea, running around the sea, going back to where they started, and back up again. And all these things just trying to find Jesus almost in a, in a panic. Kind of like chickens with their heads cut off, as my mother used to say. And um, this is really a picture of people without Jesus. Looking, 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 and, and trying to find him, and, and really what most of the time is all the wrong places. So, what follows all this now is a long discourse that uh, Jesus is going to have between him and, and three distinct groups. The first group is all these people, this, this crowd of people in general. Later, he's going to call specifically to, remember, John calls them the Jews, maybe the religious crowd. We're always, you know, following around, trying to stir up trouble. And then finally, he's going to have a time where he's talking to the disciples. And uh, the first group, uh, the one we're going to look at today, we, we, we find it in verse 26. I'm glad I'm going to read it. But, but we're not. We're just going to do the first group. And just look, look at the first couple words of verse 26. Or, or the first few words says this, Jesus answered them and said, truly, truly. Remember we talked about that several weeks ago. Whenever you see those words, truly, truly, that simply means you know, whatever Jesus says, we need to listen to it. But even Jesus sometimes introduces what he's about to say with the words that really mean you need to really listen up. Now. You really need to, to cue in to what I'm about to say because this is important. And we're going to see that it, that it really is. And, and so, before we even get there, though, I just want to pause and take it to the front of your bulletin. To this verse, this is my favorite verse of my life verse. Um, this may not be the right, but this is the goal. And, and here it is from Matthew 6, 33. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added. I want you to see that thing because what, what Jesus is saying is you will focus in the right place. I'll take care of all the other things. You know, the, the physical things, even the other spiritual things, and everything in your life, if you will focus first. And so, at least in part, 
Uh, that is the subject of this first part of the sermon that Jesus is going to preach. Now, I know y'all don't like long sermons, but you don't have to take it up with you. When you get to heaven, you take it up with him and Paul, because they were both long in the preachers sometimes. This is a long sermon that he's about to launch into, about 40 verses uh, in and around this sermon. And the major theme of this sermon is faith in Christ for eternal life. And then there's also some substance, uh, such as the one that we're going to focus on today. And that is putting a focus on life in the right place and on the right thing even while we're here living that life. Now, go back with me to verse 45, just for a minute. And read with me. It says, And when they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, and I can almost hear him going, you know, we finally found him. And when they found him, they said to him, Rabbi, who he did you get him? Because we were watching everything. We, you know, you, you know, we thought you went to the mountain, they went that way, and all of a sudden, folks came and whatever. When in the world did you get here? It's kind of what they're saying. And Jesus completely destroyed their place. Think about that one more. He's just not in the mood for small talk. He's about to launch into something very important. And here's what we know about Jesus because he's told us other places throughout the gospel. Jesus did their heart. How many of you know Jesus made the heart? You know, I think it was Abraham that says you could fool some of the people all the time and all the people some of the time. But you could never put that. Jesus knows our hearts and he knows exactly what's going on. And so we just need to come close before Jesus and about what's in our hearts. And that always works out better. But he, because he knows what's in our hearts, he's about to launch into a sermon about, first of all, the main thing is salvation. And the substance is the correct focus while we're living in this life. So again, verse 26. And Jesus answered them and said, Truly, 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 I say to you, you seek me not because you saw signs, but because you ate the loaves and you were feet. All right, now think about this for a moment. Jesus here mentioned signs. Remember back at the beginning of the chapter? Go back with me to, the, to verse Two, six, two. These, these people that were following Jesus primarily for the signs. Here's what we read. A large crowd followed him because they saw the signs which he was performing on those who were sick. So at that time, they were following because of the signs, which is another word for miracles. Because of the miracles. Here, the priority seems to have skipped. But only momentary. Okay, this is just a momentary in their priority. And Jesus said, you're not here because of science. In other words, what he's saying is, you're not here because you saw the power of God manifested and multiplied bread and fish, and you now desire to know more about God and what he's doing on the earth. Jesus says, no, that's not why you're here at all. You're here because you want to be you're here because you got faith. I mean, it's just been like a day. If you're here because, you, you know, you want more food. And just like that, Jesus exposes their true motive. That is, you're not here for the truth. Rather, you're here to give something for nothing. Now, had they been interested in, in the miracle, such for the miracle of uh, feeding 5,000, they didn't know about the walking on the water bill, obviously. But had they known about that miracle, at least there was a possibility that that kind of miracle, and tuning in on that, might actually lead them to salvation. If you remember, that's exactly what happened with Nicodemus. Go back with me a couple pages to, to uh, chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. We remember the story when Nick at night, when Nicodemus came by night, he was a Pharisee, and here's what he says. Now, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus. A ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you have come from God as a teacher, for no one can do these signs, these miracles, 
that you do and the way God is with. I want you to know it was the signs and the miracles that God had to make this for. This is what brought him to Jesus. And so Jesus is saying, if you kind of just been interested in the miracle, at least that in mind has brought you a while. And it took a while for Nicodemus. We don't know how long he showed up to help tell the body to the crucifixion of the body of Jesus. So we know by then he was a believer. But he started with the sign. But their interest, this group, their interest has fallen simply to the level of food. Now don't misunderstand me here because physical food is very important. We all know that. And it was Jesus who told us to pray like this. He said to pray, give us this day our daily bread. And so it's important. And he knows it's important. But I want you to know something. Jesus is just talking about everything in that You know, even the practical things. No matter how, how big or small those things are, he's going to do something. All right? However, he doesn't want those things to be our primary focus. He doesn't want our primary focus to be on earthly things because it was Jesus who also said that he shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And so Jesus wants us to have a heavenly focus. And think about it. If you think about it in the grand scheme of things, we're here for But we're here for a break, really. We really are. But eternity is forever. And Jesus is saying, you need to put the primary part of your focus over there. You're living right here. It's important what you're doing. And I'm going to take care of your needs, but I want you to begin to focus with an eternity. We read on about that statement in verse 27. He goes on and he says, do not work for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you, give to you, for on him the Father, God, has set his seal. So here's what's happening. Jesus is trying now to refocus people's attention to the things that are most important. He makes up an earth versus heaven comparison. And then he compares things that are, that are perishing with things that endure. Perhaps here, uh, in, in this particular verse, a better translation for the word work would be the word drive. Basically, Jesus is warning us that the things that we strive for uh, with great physical uh, effort, with uh, great emotion, great financial cost. All of these things, the physical, the emotional, the financial, and everything else, all of these things that we're striving for on this earth have one thing in common. You know what they are? They're all They're very temporary. And left to our own understanding, if, if all we knew is all we know, you know, when we're, when we're placed here on this planet, left to our own understanding, the temporary things will be all that we know about. But Jesus comes along, and he proclaims that there is a place where everything is eternal, where everything is everlasting. And how does he know that? Well, we're going to be told many times in this long sermon, but we get three of them right here in this sermon, verse 32, verse 33, verse 38, simply says in different ways, he knows because he's been there. He came from there. He came from this place called heaven, this eternal place, and came down to earth from there. So he knows about the place where nothing passes away. He knows about the place where everything lasts forever. And he's encouraging us to fix our attention on those things on eternal And that's a real challenge for a bunch of earthly good. I mean, we're, we're surrounded by the temple. I mean, this is everything we know is temple. And it's, it's hard for us because that's all we've ever known is this human. It's really what, what Jesus is calling for right here by asking us to focus on something that we've never seen, somewhere we've never been, 
something we never experienced, he's asking us to focus on faith. But not just really, really faith. Not just how about believing in faith. He's asking us to believe in faith based on the truth that he's going to spend his whole ministry and he's going to have a, a whole a four gospels written about and a whole Bible written about where he's delivering truth to us all the way through so that our faith can be based in truth. In your bulletin, you remember from the um, Sermon on the Mount, he reiterated the same message as what he said in Matthew 16 and Matthew 6. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth. Why? Because the moth and the rust will destroy it, and the thieves will break in and steal it. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither the moth nor the rust destroy, and where the thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. How did Jesus tell us that? Because he knows. He's been there. He's come there. He knows. How many of you know this? God's original intention for the earth was not to be destroyed. It was not to be a, a temporary place. God created this, this earth perfect, in absolute perfection. And you know what happened? Man came up and messed it all up. When he introduced sin into the world, he didn't just introduce sin into the people, he introduced sin into the whole creation. He has messed it all up. So here's, here's something beautiful. You know what? I did mess up. I did mess up. The same property that God called him out. And so man didn't mess up heaven. And so the beautiful thing is that we can lay up treasures from here now over there. And, and here's what we can know. We can be sure of all that we just said because this verse tells us that God has set his seal on Jesus as his personal intention. How many know that, that, that day when a king would uh, send out a document? He knew what was in that document. He believed what was in that document. And he would never put his seal on that document until that document was just what he said. And that's what, that's what God is saying. God the Father said, I put my seal on you. I sent him to you. And the seal on him is your guarantee. But I want you to notice what they picked up on, what the crowd picked up on. Uh, they picked up on the word work. Remember when, when Jesus says, do not work for the food that perishes? Well, that's where they landed. In verse 28, here's what we read. Therefore, they said to him, well, what shall we do so that we may work the works of God. You see how they're all focused on, on doing and working and, and all those things. And basically what they're saying is, give us the rules, Jesus, so that we will know what we have to do to get into this eternal place to talk about. You know what? That's religion thinking. That's always religion thinking. We gotta work for our salvation. We we gotta do things for our salvation. We gotta be good to get our salvation. Here's the problem: we we, we believe in religion that we gotta work for salvation, but we're just not sure what works to do, and we're we're not sure how much of that work to do, and we can never seem to know whether we did enough in the right time. In other words, how do we know we made the grade? They're always trying because they just don't know if they made the grave for sin. And then legalism comes along and it says you just do a bunch of good stuff. You just be good. Well, how do you know when you've been doing that? How do you know everybody has had some kind of good? I'm thinking Adolf Hitler. Probably reached down and patted his dog in the head one day and told him, Well, did something good. Maybe that was all he ever did. I don't know. But everybody does something good, so there's a level of goodness. So who we can pay our goodness to? If we're going to if we're going to base our salvation on goodness, how do we know when we've been good enough? Certainly not Hitler's, you know, a standard, but maybe it's the next door neighbor. Maybe it's you know. How are we going to know? What, what is good to us? And so, there again, that's what legalism does. That's what religion 
to you today. He says, give me some rules so I can know. Here's what I want you to see. They heard Jesus say the word work, but they completely changed the way it Look again in verse 27. The food which he gives to his own life, which the Son of Man will give. They missed that. And so Jesus has to straighten them out. And here's what we do in verse 29. And Jesus answered and said to him, This is the work of God that you believe in him who he has sent. And so what Jesus is saying is there's only one kind of work that's necessary. It's the work of God. And you know what it is? That's what it is. Believe. People get all caught up in the argument sometimes. Well, I thought you said you do that to me. Anything to be said. So they look at the leaders of the God says, well, you can say, well, you can In other words, God has done all the real work. Jesus has done all the real work on the cross. And all he's asking for us is to believe. Believe in the one that was sent by God, that is Jesus. So how many of you know that word believe? Huge deal in the Bible. Huge deal in the New Testament. He is 241 times in the New Testament. Guess this, though. Out of 241 times, 98 of those times, the word belief is used this word. John was big on belief. Take them for granted. Take them, folks. Take them and give them away. This is the thing. Is believing in Jesus. And so you say, well, well what way can I say? Doesn't God want us to obey? To obey Him? Answer? Yes. But He wants you to obey Him. He wants you to obey Him for relationship. He wants you to obey Him because that says that He's trusted. You believe in him and you trust in him. In other words, he might tell you to do something that you would rather do it another way. It is when you obey him, you're saying, I believe I trust in him. I'm going to do it your way. But that's not what he should say, what you do, how you obey. Your belief cannot be your you know, you're, you're doing obedience to save you. What saves you is your faith in the one who God has sent you. Who God has sent to die on that cross for you. So it's not what you do, it's what He did that results in your faith in Him. Let's look at verse 30. So they said to Him, What then do you do for the Son so that we may see and believe in you? What work do you perform? Now we're back to the sun. It says that like the Lord you do, we're basically saying, preach. First of all, what you're saying by doing some signs. Give us a miracle so we can believe you. And like many of uh, us, likely many of these were in that same crowd, like I said before, where Jesus miraculously fed them just the day before. And now they're looking for a sign. And Jesus is probably thinking, what part of abundant food for everybody do you not get? You're asking for a sign. You just saw a sign yesterday. It reminds me of someone who, who maybe recently did a great favor for someone and says, yeah, but what do you think for me later? That's kind of what they're saying here. But here's what they were like with some just a little deeper. They were looking for about the history. Verse 31. They said, Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness. That's the form of bread that is the case. As it is written, He gave them bread out of heaven to eat. Now, that's what the scripture says, but like so many other things, throughout the, the decades, even the centuries, the rabbis, the rabbis have started teaching kind of their own. And that was one of the cases here. The rabbi had taught that when the Messiah would come, 
he would duplicate the miracle of the man in the desert. Remember the man in the desert when Moses led the children of Israel out of Egypt to the body of the city and so forth. And they got out into the desert 40 years before Egypt and the promised land, and they were hungry. And God said that he would not have for 40 years after the the day. So they're looking back at that. We read about it right here in Deuteronomy 18, 16. The Lord your God, speaking of the future, speaking of Jesus, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me, this is Moses, from among you, from your countrymen, and you shall listen to him. That was a prophecy of Jesus. But in Judaism, the Messiah was often called the prophet. Look, look over at verse 14. 14 in the chapter. 6 14. Therefore, when the people saw the sign which he had performed, they said, This is true. The prophet who is to come into the world. Go back with me a little bit further to chapter 1. Remember when John the Baptist came? We read this before we started this book. John 1, verse 21. They didn't know for sure what he was, so it says, and they asked him, what then? Are you Elijah? He said, I'm not. Are you the prophet? He didn't to no. And so when they thought of Messiah, they, they thought of him as the prophet. And, and so Moses spoke of this prophet that was to come. And so they seemed to, to take, in comparison, they seem to take the feeding of the 5,000. We look at that and say, wow, like I said before, that is a super miracle. They look at it and say, hey, I mean, not so much. Not so much. I mean, you fed everybody for one meal. But Moses, he, he fed everybody in the desert every day except back. And on Friday, he gets twice as much. I mean, that's a real miracle. And so what they begin to do is they, they start a false comparison over yeah. Jesus answered, verse 32. Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, it's not Moses who has given you the bread out of heaven. And it wasn't. It, you know, we know it was God that gave them the bread out of heaven. All right? But what this? Now fast forward. But it is my Father who gives you the true bread out of heaven. And of course, the true bread is speaking right now in his book. He says, truly, truly, listen up is what he's saying. It wasn't Moses, it was God. And God the Father is the one who gives the true bread. We read this in John 1, 17, every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above coming down from the Father of life, with whom there is no variation of scripture. All right, so, Argument is about dead. So seven times in this song, Jesus refers to himself as the one who speaks down from heaven. Now, no other religion can claim that. No other religion even attempts to claim that their God comes down out of heaven as a man on a mission to save me. God let him in the world of one nation to say, man, it's about comparison. Jesus is saying, this bread is the bread of heaven. It's the eternal bread. Verse 33. For the bread of God is that which comes down out of heaven and gives life to the world. You see, they saw bread as something that was literal. You know, a loaf of bread, life to save. Jesus is saying that the bread that, that he brings, or the bread that he is, is the bread that gives eternal life. The manna back there in the desert was temporary. And everybody who ever ate that bread eventually died. But Jesus is saying that the bread that I bring you, the bread that the Father sends you to me, is the bread that will be forever. No death in it comes back to the opposite. It's just the bread that brings life. See, this bread is not in a physical way. It's saying that the living is true. The Lord Jesus Christ is saying, we're so close. 
Then they said to him, Lord, always give us this bread. It's kind of reminiscent, isn't it, of the woman at the well. You remember what she said about that, about that living water? Before, before she really figured it all out, she said, well, you know about this water that, that just goes on forever. Give me some of that water so I won't have to keep returning to this well. Well, they're saying the same thing now. Give us this kind of bread, and we won't have to go looking for bread any longer. You know, it's still, it's still the same way with a lot of people today. Because they want Jesus only for what Jesus has to offer. You know, what, what can I do? What can I do? Then verse 35 says, And Jesus said it, I am the bread of life. And you come to me when I'm hungry, and who believes in me, will never serve. This is actually the first of the seven I am statements in the Gospel of John. It's the only place you find the I am statement. It's in the Gospel of John. There are seven of them. All of them are the point of Jesus, the deity. He says, people say, here, I am the bread of life. A little bit later, he's going to say, I'm the life of the world. He'll say, I'm the door to the people. In other words, the only way to get He'll say, I am the good shepherd. He'll say, I am the resurrection and the life. Here's my favorite. He will say, I am the way. And finally, he will say, I am the And all of these things of God as the Savior. Remember when God revealed his name to Moses, he said, Believing in Jesus is not simply an intellectual thing. It, it means to come to Him and to feel the faith of Him. That's all. And just like with the bread of life, the living water that we talked about a minute ago, it, it actually means to receive Jesus so fully that you receive Jesus within Him. Just as you would receive food or water. Within it, to make the people see Jesus that way. Look what happens in verse 36. But I said to you that you have seen me, and yet you did not believe. This is the issue. This is the old issue right here. You do not believe. And so they, Jesus said, You're rejecting the truth that I'm bringing you. You do not believe. And then we read the last four verses for today. Verse 37 the following. All that the Father gives me to come to me. And the one who comes to me, I will certainly not say so. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of him who sent me. That of all that he has given me, I lose nothing, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of the Father, that everyone, everyone who beholds the Son, and believes in me, for he has become one. And I myself will raise him up. What you just heard me read is the process of personal salvation. It is among some of the most profound words that Jesus has spoken. First, he said that he came from heaven. 2,000 years later, we accept that statement without difficulty. We just do. We just believe that as Christians, but we accept it very easily. But it wasn't just the case in their day. In their day, that statement that I came from heaven meant that Jesus wasn't like everybody else. He looked like everybody else, talked like everybody else, dressed like everybody else. But it was a bold statement that says it's not like everybody else. It's, it's a bold statement that says he pre existed. I mean, he's from heaven. He existed before anything. It's a bold statement that says he's divine. That he came from God. 
And so then he goes on to explain salvation. Now, he explains it real easy. We just don't need it really. This is a very difficult place to go right now. It's going to go there anyway. Uh, because it's going to continue on in some of the But he explained that salvation involves both divine sovereignty and human responsibility. This is where predestination and free will do not, not collide, but do not. And that's hard for us to put together with our limited intellect. In fact, there's in house debate that's been going on for hundreds of years over this stuff. There are attempts to take a short shot at it, and I think this is the goal, this is the time. Maybe help you understand a little bit more. I checked the bus schedule on the Green Club yesterday. And if you wanted to go to Green Club tonight and get on the bus and go to Charlotte, you've got one that you have to do this. You've got to be there at 545 right before the next day. If you arrive at Charlotte, it's 845. It'll cost you $43.99. That schedule, that destination has already been predetermined. That bus is going to leave Great Club and come West Coast. And you go there and you buy your ticket, and you stand there at the door and think about it, and you say, Well, I'm going And you get the cheap way of not going to get on the bus. You get just two more choices. If you're one of the first ones on the bus, you might get the cheap way of not going you get to choose whether you want to read a, a book or a magazine, whether you want to play with your phone, whether you want to have a conversation with another pastor. Maybe take a quick nap. You get to choose all of those things. But where that bus is going and when that bus is going is totally out of your opinion. That bus is going to go whether you own it or not. It'll go whether anybody's on it or not. Personally, I choose not to go to Charlotte. Or even Greensboro. I don't want to go to any one of them. But, you know, that's just me. But the bus is still going to go. Now, let me give you a a, 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 a easier one to understand. Hopefully. There's a passage in Scripture. We we talked about it a lot. You know, it's 10, 24, 25. Let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not to set our own assembly together. And this is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day growing deep. Now, I want you to think about that for a moment. God put that in His Word. God put it in His Word. I want you to gather with believers. He told us some different reasons why. But the same thing is, Mark that it read, I want you to be together with believers. Right? And so when you woke up this morning, you knew it was Sunday morning. You knew this is the time we normally gather with believers. And you knew, because God has already said it, this is not a question. God would like to be in church. His will would be for you to gather with other believers. However, you have to make that final decision whether you're going to come or not. Again, it's hard for us to understand, but both of these positions are supported by Scripture. Verse 37 says, God gives to the Son. That's the sovereignty. But then Jesus says, but these must come. They must come and place their faith. They have to believe in the Son. That's personal responsibility. And from that day on, Jesus says, they will have eternal security. Even one day in the future, I'll come back and get them all. And so, for our limited human perspective, we can't see how divine sovereignty and human responsibility work together. But from God's perspective, there's actually no conflict. Someone in that one time, uh, Charles had Spurgeon, how he reconciled these two issues, the sovereignty of God, the free will of man. And his answer was, I never try to reconcile freedom. 
Here's what we know. It's God's will for sin to be saved. We read it in 1 Timothy 10.3. This is the good acceptable of sight of God our faith who desires how many? All men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Peter signs in 2 Peter 3 9. The Lord's not slow about his promise, some can count slowness, but he's patient towards you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. And then, of course, John 3 16 tells us that God so loved the world, the whole world, that he gave us such a God's son that whoever responds to that gift, Whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Verse 39 here tells us that God gives, verse 40 tells us that man believes. And those who trust Jesus will be secured in their faith. And believers receive eternal life. Now fast forward to verse 44. Because no one can come to him unless the Father is sent to God. Okay? That's the sovereignty. And I'll raise him up in the last day. Draw them. You know what the Father does? He draws us. Sometimes he uses the Holy Spirit to draw us. So, one verse, last verse I want you to see. This is from, this is from the New Testament. It's talking about Old Testament days. Here's what it says. I can't be fixed in the church days, saying, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. In other words, what he's implying here is if you, if you feel him drawing, if you hear him drawing you, don't fuck up and say, no. Don't harden your heart. What he's saying is, he's drawing you, go to him. And he's saying that when you do, you'll be saved and you'll be eternal in the world. Yeah, I have this different side of the Holy Spirit. Here's what I know. Here's what I know. Because I know, and I believe this is all my heart, we're going to walk into heaven and within five minutes we're going to say, I'm going to buy you this. It makes total sense now. Because we don't know what we're going to do. So I can tell you how it all happened. All I can tell you is there's lots of scripture that supports both. God has a way of not conflicting, but not conflicting. God is talking. Go back to the garden. I'm 
Praise the God shouted. Amen. All right. Y'all have a great day. See you back this afternoon if you can make it. 2 30 station, 3 o'clock central. If I don't see you, I'll see you in a week from now. Y'all have a great week and God bless everyone.